I'm John McKee, editor of Messianic Apologetics, www.messianicapologetics.net. If you are new to the channel, be sure to subscribe for future teachings and updates. Messianic Insider is a podcast offering you something that your local Messianic congregation is usually not set up to provide. Offer a place to discuss critical and very deep issues which affect the future and stability of our faith community. We want to thank you for your regular offerings and support toward our ministry efforts. You can donate online at outreachisrael.net forward slash support. Today on Messianic Insider, we are concluding our One Law Controversies series. In part one, we will be reviewing a few of the negative characteristics out there about the One Law or One Torah sub-movement, sorting through much of its legalism. But then in part two, wanting to end this series on a positive note, we'll be discussing sanctifying grace, a supernatural compulsion to obey God more and more. Let's begin. Our material is taken, of course, from our ministry publication, The Messianic Torah Helper. A link is available in the description. The One Law or One Torah sub-movement sorting through the legalism. Since the early 2000 aughts, the One Law or One Torah sub-movement has brought various passages in the Torah or Pentateuch to the attention of many Bible readers, which surely have needed to be probed and analyzed. There are many people out there in the Messianic Jewish movement who, in wanting to discuss the problems with the One Law or One Torah sub-movement, almost never examine any of the Torah passages which use the terminology One Law or One Statute. And that is equally a problem. Now, the analysis that we have offered uh, over the past uh, several parts of this series which has focused not only on various issues from the text, terminology, like one law or one statute, whatever it is, but is also quoted from different commentaries on Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, is not the kind that is often witnessed by proponents of a one law or one Torah theology, or even opponents. What instead tends to be witnessed here by strong advocates of a one-law theology are haphazard quotations from Exodus 12.49. The same law shall apply to the native as to the stranger who sojourns among you, or Numbers 15.29. You shall have one law for him who does anything unintentionally, for him who is native among the sons of Israel, and for the alien who sojourns among them, both references here in New American Standard, without any quantitative consideration for their wider co-text or the circumstances or negative circumstances in ancient Israel requiring for such statements to be made. These statements have been frequently invoked by non-Jewish Messianic believers to emphasize that within the community of ancient Israel, both the native and welcome sojourner were supposed to adhere to the same basic Torah instruction. No one in the general population of ancient Israel was surely going to be discouraged from obeying as much of God's instruction as they legitimately could. However, as we have witnessed in this analysis, and if you need to go back and re-watch or re-listen to some presentations, please do so. Strident one law or one Torah proponents 
have not done a very good job at assessing what various statements involving one law or one statute meant in terms of their ancient context. It cannot be denied how at least one of the one law passages pertains to uniform execution of sinners. Leviticus 24.22 What is this supposed to mean for us in a post-resurrection era where capital punishment has been decisively absorbed by Yeshua's sacrifice? Colossians 2.14 When one law is emphasized among people in various groups, what spiritual dynamics are being invoked? These are factors which do not at all tend to be considered by proponents of a one law or one Torah theology. It is true that within the community of ancient Israel, that direction is witnessed involving how all, native and sojourner alike, were to come together at the Feast of Tabernacles, listen to and heed Moses' teaching. Deuteronomy 31, 10 to 13. That all of God's people today should be educated in the Torah and be applying its principles of holiness to their lives should hardly be a problem. It is unavoidable, for example, how in ancient Israel, an institution such as the Seventh-day Sabbath or Shabbat was inclusive, with not only natives and sojourners, but even animals to be afforded rest. Exodus 20.10, 23.12, Deuteronomy 5.14. In the Messianic age, all of humanity will be decisively keeping the Sabbath. Isaiah 66.23. And we live in a time when the realities of the Messianic age should already be breaking in to our present faith experience. For many individual adherents of a one law point of view, the emphasis is on today's Jewish and non-Jewish believers both taking instruction from Moses' teaching and being united together in Israel's Messiah as brothers and sisters, as fellow members of the Commonwealth of Israel. Ephesians 2, 11-13, 3-6. Many have used Torah passages emphasizing one law or one statute to stress the equality of God's people, Galatians 3, 28, and how a relatively uniform standard of jurisprudence for all within the community of ancient Israel was certainly contrary to the different law codes of the ancient Near East, where different classes of people were not all held to the same standard before the law. For many individual adherents of a one law point of view, you have a Torah for all ethos rightly promoted, but with the wrong biblical texts promoting it. In practice, the one law or one Torah submovement is not broadly facilitating assemblies and fellowships where the study of the Torah and being discipled in its precepts as a person grows in the Messiah and in his love is what is being emphasized. What people too frequently encounter from the one law or one Torah submovement is a great deal of legalism, judgmentalism, pride and superiority, a condemnatory spirit, and stifling environments widely devoid of the presence of God's grace. Assemblies where one law or one statute is emphasized hardly tend to be places where the Holy Spirit can easily write the Torah's commandments on hearts and minds at the Holy Spirit's pace onto a redeemed man or woman. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. Instead, the one law or one Torah submovement is a place where rigidity and fundamentalism tend to abound and even be encouraged. The one law or one Torah submovement, because of its fundamentalist orientation, is hardly in a position to deal with the complicated theological and spiritual issues which will hit the Messianic movement in the 2020s, many of them dealing with biblical historicity and reliability, as well as scientific criticism against the scriptures. Problems 
with the Torah being something relevant for all of God's people today, have principally erupted not by non-Jewish believers studying the weekly Torah portions or reading the Old Testament more frequently or even keeping a Sabbath rest. Problems have erupted when a rigid, legalistic attitude is allowed to fester and bad attitudes are not challenged and confronted. I myself, in my ministry interactions with various strident proponents of a one law or one Torah theology, have had a number of altercations or even serious altercations. Most of these altercations involve a failure on the part of one law or one Torah proponents to consider post-resurrection era realities resultant from the sacrifice of Yeshua the Messiah for human sins. Disagreements abound from an inflexibility on the part of many when it comes to the application of the Torah in modern 21st century settings, particularly in those venues when life intervenes. Little, if any, troubleshooting has been conducted on their part. What if a family member serves pork or shellfish to you as a guest? This is where many supporters of a one law or one Torah theology will, unfortunately, be found to often cause a scene rather than quietly ask God to forgive them because of various circumstances, recognizing that Yeshua's salvation is certainly there to cover their infraction. A ministry like Outreach Israel and Messianic Apologetics recognizes that today's Messianic movement is a profoundly important end time move of God. We most definitely advocate that we all need to be paying close attention to how the Messianic movement has, number one, been responsible for seeing a generation of Jewish people come to saving faith in Yeshua as the Messiah of Israel, and number two, has been responsible for seeing many evangelical Protestant believers exposed to their Hebraic roots in the Tanakh and Jewish roots in the Second Temple era. Messianic congregations where Jewish and non-Jewish believers come together as one new man or humanity, Ephesians 2.15, are places where the shared spiritual virtues of Judaism and evangelical Protestantism get to interact as we contemplate a grand future involving the trajectory of all Israel will be saved, Romans 11.26, and a return of Israel's Messiah and King to reign over planet Earth. Given our wide array of writings and publications, our ministry does believe that all of God's people, Jewish and non-Jewish, should be following God's Torah as we all grow in God's grace and holiness. This includes today's believers honoring the seventh day Sabbath or Shabbat, appointed times of Leviticus 23, and eating a kosher style of diet. While there are issues of Torah jurisprudence to be evaluated regarding each of these topics, especially as they can regard the expectations of the native and sojourner in ancient Israel, rather than emphasize one law needing to be followed or strictly followed, our approach to matters of Torah observance, today in the post-resurrection era, must instead be to stress the work of the promised new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, Hebrews 8, 8 to 12, 10, 15 to 17, and in the Holy Spirit supernaturally transcribing God's commandments onto a redeemed heart and mind. As this happens, while there should be changes witnessed in terms of various outward commandments being observed, there should also be a substantially greater implementation of the critical Torah commands to love God and neighbor. Deuteronomy 6.5, Leviticus 19.18, Matthew 19.19, 19, 22.39, Mark 12.31, Luke 10.27, Romans 13.9, Galatians 5.14, James 2.8.
far from emphasizing Torah passages which employ terms such as one law or one statute, it is much better and more spiritually profitable for us to focus our attention around the thrust of a passage like Deuteronomy 31.12. Assemble the people so that they may hear and learn and fear the Lord your God and be careful to observe all the words of this law. New American Standard. Here, all within the community of God would learn and appreciate and follow the instruction of God. This kind of statement invokes very positive, educative dynamics. But beyond this, and more critical for our 21st century messianic movement, is how the prophets anticipated a massive turning toward Zion by the nations of the earth to be taught the Torah. Matthew, excuse me, Micah 4, 1 to 3, Isaiah 2, 2 to 4, resulting in worldwide peace. If we are to give the Torah its proper place in our messianic faith practice, then it is most advisable that we focus our attention around edifying biblical promises like that of the New Covenant, to Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, also Hebrews 8, 8 to 12, where the Lord will not only cleanse the sins of his people, but supernaturally transcribe his law onto their hearts. It is prophesied that in the last days, the nations will come to Zion to be instructed from the Torah. Math, excuse, Micah 4, 1 to 3, Isaiah 2, 2 to 4. Something which makes the law most relevant to be heeded by non-Jewish believers. Couple this with an emphasis on God's grace, superabounding, Romans 5, 20. And I believe that our approach to the Torah will not only be very healthy, but we will be forced to recognize the work of the Holy Spirit as key. Such a sanctification ethos will make Torah observant people really consider the love and mercy of God at work in their hearts. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. And they will be less prone to judge others who at present do not live the same way that they do. They will be more consciously aware of the need for their obedience to reflect God's goodness and blessing, Deuteronomy 4, 6, and 7. Our primary emphasis as born-again believers should not be one law or one statute, but instead should be focused in what Messiah Yeshua has accomplished for us all in being sacrificed for our sins and resurrected from the dead. As a result of following our Messiah, we should be educated in Moses' teaching and recognize how important and relevant many of its commandments and directions truly are for human life in the 21st century. We are now going to take a quick break, and when we come back with part two, we will be discussing sanctifying grace, a supernatural compulsion to obey God more and more. I'm John McKee, editor of Messianic Apologetics, www.messianicapologetics.net. Welcome back. On this episode of Messianic Insider, we are finishing up our One Law Controversies series. In part one today, we reviewed some of the negative aspects of the One Law or One Torah sub-movement sorting through some of its legalism. But simply because one, like myself, does not choose to identify as one law or one Torah, and has a differing point of view regarding some of the Torah passages which employ the terminology one law or one statute, hardly means all of a sudden that I think that 
God's Torah is irrelevant for Jewish and non-Jewish believers. I believe God's Torah is very relevant. I believe that all of us should be educated in God's Torah, and all of us should be heeding God's Torah. And so now, in part two, we'll be discussing what I have labeled as sanctifying grace, a supernatural compulsion to obey God more and more. Because when we review the contents of the New Covenant of Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36, also specifically quoted in Hebrews 8 and 10, you see that there's not only the promise of God's people being cleansed from their sin and given a new heart and mind, but also that God's Spirit will supernaturally write His instructions, His commandments, His laws onto a new heart and mind. That's what I would consider to be supernatural compulsion and obedience to God's instruction in Moses' teaching via the empowerment of his spirit. And how often in the One Law or One Torah sub-movement do you hear about the work of the Holy Spirit? As you grow in obedience to God, you're also supposed to be growing in the love and mercy of God. In my experience, I haven't heard about it that much. Yet, so many of the challenges that we have when it comes to quote-unquote Torah observance in the Messianic community, they would be immediately solved if we emphasized how all of us in our obedience to the Lord need to be tempered by the grace and mercy of the Lord shown to us. And so perhaps we need to extend it to other people who may not necessarily show or share our views or may be even hostile to our views. Of course, our material is taken from our ministry publication, The Messianic Torah Helper. Sanctifying grace, a supernatural compulsion to obey God more and more. It is inappropriate for any of us to advocate that the Torah should or must be mandated upon any of God's people, be they Jewish or non-Jewish, because mandating, dictating, obligating, impressing, or ordering, or even inflicting the commandments onto someone is not consistent with the ethos of the New Covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, Hebrews 8, 8 to 12, 10, 15 to 17. We live in a post-resurrection era where obedience to the Lord is undeniably to be guided by his people having received his forgiveness via the Messiah's atoning sacrifice, Luke 22, 20, and where the activity of the Holy Spirit inside a regenerated human heart compels people to heed and obey the scriptures. We need to recognize how salvation history has progressed forward. And we live in a time which is to be decisively dominated by the work of the Spirit in the lives of all Messiah followers. In considering the role of God's Torah in the lives of today's born again, I have found that my own Wesleyan upbringing might offer us the best theological framework to consider. Within Wesleyan theology, one will find the terminology sanctifying grace frequently employed to describe a born-again believer's life following the moment of salvation, which itself is often called justifying grace. As the Holy Spirit moves on the hearts of God's people throughout their lifetimes, continually molding them to be more and more like Jesus in the way that they love others and obey him. Addressing Romans 3.31 in his sermon, The Law Established by Faith, John Wesley probably gives many of today's Messianic believers some useful direction on how to approach the Torah. He says this, Let us thus endeavor to establish the law in ourselves, 
not sinning because we are under grace, but rather using all the power we receive thereby to fulfill all righteousness, calling to mind what light we receive from God while his spirit was convicting us of sin, let us beware we do not put out that light. What we had then attained, let us hold fast. Let nothing induce us to build again what we have destroyed, to resume anything, small or great, which we then clearly saw was not for the glory of God, or the profit of our own soul, or to neglect anything, small or great, which we could not then neglect without a check from our own conscience. To increase and perfect the light which we had before, let us now add the light of faith. Confirm we the former gift of God by a deeper sense of whatever he had then shown us, by a greater tendency of conscience and a more exquisite sensibility of sin. Walking now with joy and not with fear, in a clear, steady sight of things eternal, we shall look on with pleasure, wealth, praise, all things of earth as on bubbles upon water, counting nothing important, nothing desirable, nothing worth a deliberate thought, but what is only within the veil where Jesus sitteth at the right hand of God. Men and women who are guided by God's grace and mercy to no longer commit sin and violate his law have placed at the very center of their being Yeshua the Messiah, exalted and reigning as king. They recognize that salvation is by grace, but that actions reflective of such salvation are to be required. Ephesians 2, 8-10 In establishing or upholding the law of God in their lives, they desire to accomplish the good works that he requires of us, particularly actions of kindness and mercy. James 1:27. Obeying the Lord is neither an option to be dismissed, nor a legalistic mandate. Obeying the Lord is a supernatural compulsion enacted by the perfecting activity of the Holy Spirit on the human soul. The more we obey the Lord and submit ourselves to His will, the more we are able to experience His presence and communion in our hearts, being conformed to the image of Yeshua. Romans 8.29, and become repelled not only by the presence of sin, but even the mention of it, Ephesians 5.3. The desire to obey is innately connected with the desire to know the Lord more and more intimately. A position of supernatural compulsion for all of God's people today following the Torah can help us avoid the pitfalls of either thinking that obedience is not really expected of us, or that the law is going to be forced down upon us as some heavy anvil to drag around. A position of supernatural compulsion, emphasizing the work of the Holy Spirit, is undoubtedly guided by a motive of love for God and neighbor, the most important of the Torah commandments. A position of supernatural compulsion does advocate a to that a Torah submissive walk is expected of all of God's people, but it is to be found as an individual grows in holiness and spiritual maturity and is not to be legalistically imposed or coerced by outside forces. The speed that one heeds the message of some commandments might be faster for some and slower for others. Nevertheless, if there are Messianic congregations and assemblies which are full of loving people who recognize the centrality of Yeshua to our faith, they will facilitate an environment where a steady Torah obedience is manifested. It will not be the job of individuals to play the Holy Spirit, as it were, but rather be there to patiently and lovingly mentor and guide newer people be they evangelical Christians embracing their Hebraic roots or Messianic Jews rediscovering their Jewish heritage to be everything they can be in the Lord. No one in the Messianic movement should ever allow themselves to be denigrated over how much or how little of the Torah they are able to follow. Yet at the same time, we should all take a helping interest in those who appear to remain perpetual spiritual plebeians 
and our struggling disciples. One of the understandable questions that might be raised about a supernatural compulsion position for people keeping the Torah is that if the New Covenant promise is to not only cleanse people from sin, but also divinely transcribe the Torah onto hearts, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, Hebrews 8, 8 to 12, then what do we do about the millions of Christians in the world who claim to know Jesus, but who do not expel a huge effort to keep the law? Are they not filled with the Spirit? God, as the eternal creator, is the ultimate judge of any human being. And only he knows for certain whether Christians or Jews really have a heart for obeying him. Likewise, only God, as the eternal creator, knows how to orchestrate the circumstances and timing in the lives of different Christian people, and possibly also their religious communities, to expose them to messianic things. For many of us in today's messianic movement at present, and most especially in a North American diaspora messianic movement, we represent some of the early people exposed to what the Lord is doing in this final stretch of history. Others are coming. As Paul clearly attests in Romans 5.20, the law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. God's grace will always super abound and is able to overcome the power or influence of sin. Many Christians today are genuinely saved people, but are often just uninformed or underinformed as to what the Torah teaches. Many of them keep a considerable bulk of the law and do not even consciously realize it. Yet, in those areas where they are not in obedience, most of which are relatively minor, if they truly know the Lord Yeshua, his shed blood and permanent atonement definitely covers their transgressions. Our ministry has never advocated that today's evangelical Protestantism is some kind of illegitimate imposter religion, more in touch with accomplishing the objectives of the adversary than in achieving the mission of God. We have advocated that the church has flaws to be certain, but it is the responsibility of Messianic believers to build on the positive legacy of faithful Protestant men and women who have preceded us in the faith. Every bit as much as it is our duty to build on the positive legacy of Judaism. My own personal family background in both Methodism and Presbyterianism is full of significant examples of men and women who followed, to the best of their knowledge and understanding, the Mosaic Law and were hard workers who made a difference in their generations. They certainly believed in the importance of the Ten Commandments for Christian living. I am easily reminded of my great-great-grandfather or my great-grandmother, who once they found religion, were rather rigid Sunday Sabbath keepers, and who were probably more serious about the Fourth Commandment than many of today's Messianics. I believe myself to be continuing much of what they have left me with because what their lives and legacy have imparted down to me is not at all meaningless. They were certainly not lawless people. It was not that difficult for a family like mine who never believed that the law was abolished by Christ to be convicted by the Holy Spirit that we needed to consider a messianic walk of faith and that we needed to consider how we could more fully live like Jesus. Via a series of unique life circumstances, we were supernaturally compelled to do this. And we know it is, is God's intention for us to faithfully serve the Messianic community in teaching Yeshua-centered discipleship. Many of you who are in all probability non-Jewish believers in the Messianic movement have a similar testimony of embracing a Messianic lifestyle. Some of you who are Jewish believers may even have a special testimony of how you discovered the Messiah and how you personally know that something unique and different 
is going on in the Messianic world. Our ministry does very much believe that we are all to hear and follow Moses' teaching. But Torah observance is not the beginning and end to one's faith. And ritual or outward holiness is largely meaningless if it is unaccompanied by ethical and moral holiness. If we do not know how to love God and neighbor by submitting ourselves to a more targeted obedience to the law, then what have we done? If we hit others with a hard stick of legalism, rather than welcome them into our homes and fellowships with a carrot of generosity to experience the blessings of God's Torah firsthand, then we misrepresent the gracious Heavenly Father we serve. If we do not emphasize mutual respect and honor for Judaism and Christianity, and the positive ways that they have both employed the law of Moses over the centuries, as incomplete as some of them may have been, then how do we ever hope to see diverse groups of people today who look to the Holy One of Israel to come closer together? Let us commit ourselves to be men and women of God, empowered by His Holy Spirit, guided by the love of Yeshua, and keep His commandments while spreading His goodness to all. Now, while this closes up our One Law Controversies series, I stress that this is hardly the end of the discussion. There are different subject matters where I believe many people in the One Law or One Torah sub-movement have left something of a negative impact, which need to be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. They involve not only how one law people typically approach matters like Shabbat or the appointed times or the Sabbath. They may also involve how one law people approach issues concerning biblical historicity, scientific criticism against the Bible, men and women in the body of Messiah, and also realities inaugurated resultant of the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. Now, other people in the Messianic community who do not necessarily identify with a one law or one Torah theology have left various negative impacts on these subject matters as well. So it's not as though one law people are only the ones who have made mistakes. There are people in Messianic Judaism who have made mistakes. We are all human. We have all made mistakes. But I hope as we've gone through this series, addressing the specific Torah passages which use one law or one statute, you can see that while I believe that people identifying with a one law or one Torah theology have misapplied those passages, I am hardly against non-Jewish believers coming into the Messianic community and committing themselves to a life of Torah obedience, provided that it is a genuine work of the Holy Spirit, not a legalistic work of the flesh. We run into problems when people do all of these things and they are not tempered by God's love and God's mercy. And indeed, I have had Incidents in the past with people who strongly identify with a one law or one Torah theology. They haven't really troubleshooted some of the different matters of Torah observance. They probably have not taken into consideration post-resurrection era realities. And while I do my best not to be antagonistic to them, I try to maintain a dialogue where I can. It's not always easy. 2020 is a very fascinating year. This is not the year many of us expected it was going to be. Many things have been exposed in 2020 regarding some of the limitations, not only of religion in general, evangelicalism in America, uh, but also our Messianic faith community. And there is a real fight for the future happening right now of the Messianic movement and what it is here for. 
It is undeniable that the Messianic movement is here to see Jewish people come to faith in Israel's Messiah. But it is also undeniable, as attested by prophecies like Isaiah 2, 2 to 4, Micah 4, 1 to 3, that the nations will be streaming to Zion in the end times to be instructed in Moses' teaching. These two things are occurring simultaneously in our midst. And why do we have shows like Messianic Insider? So we can discuss all of the things going on in the Messianic movement. And the title Messianic Insider was chosen specifically because our family has been involved in the Messianic movement for 25 years. I have been in the Messianic movement since I was in high school. And so a lot of the things we talk about, we're not just reading them in books, we've experienced them on the ground. And we are striving the best that we can do by God's grace to facilitate stability in an increasingly more complicated and decrepit world. If you all found this content enjoyable and useful, please be sure to drop a thumbs up for this teaching. As always, we thank you for your continued support of our ministry's efforts. God bless and shalom, and we'll see you again soon. In the meantime, be sure to check us out at www.messianicapologetics.net.